Testing. There we go. Hi. You're the only service that didn't clap for the announcements. I want you to know that. Cecilia, they didn't clap for you. Well, good morning. We have a baptism at one uh, during this service. Uh, we always like doing it during the service so that people can witness. Uh, so we'll include it in the service so that you guys um, can be an encouragement to those being baptized. The service always ends, the third service at 1.15. Um, those who signed up, Robert Makoka and Muthoni, Muthoni, Muthoni. yeah, I'll just call you Muthoni. Um, you signed up, please come. But anybody who wants to be baptized can be baptized. We don't care. Spontaneous baptisms. We don't need to run you through a theological class to be baptized. You believe in the gospel. You want to be baptized. Uh, you haven't been baptized. You can get baptized. Or if you have, maybe you were baptized as an infant in the Catholic or Anglican church. Um, we really don't believe in that kind of stuff. Um, we believe you should be baptized willfully. Um, kind of like a marriage ceremony. It's a symbol where you proclaim the gospel, you proclaim before those uh, witnesses that you belong to Jesus Christ. Also, as the announcements mentioned, please don't forget our Christmas concerts where we do Christmas carols. It'll be an awesome time. That is the 18th and 19th of December. Two days, they're both the same concerts just so we can spread out the numbers of people and um, I'll give more opportunities. John chapter 15, you can hold your place there. John 15, as we talk a few things, and then today we're going to go through those 11 verses. Um, we already went through expositionally verses 1 through 8, but today will be more of a sermon, more of a sermon than an exposition. Um, knowing what fruit is. I don't want you to leave today, not, you, you know, we've been hearing this, we, it's, a, it's a famous scripture, abide in me and you'll bear fruit. But we need to know what some of the fruit that Jesus is talking about is. Um, not some ambiguous, unclear way of just going out, it's like, well, we're supposed to abide in Jesus and bear fruit, we kind of know what abiding is. We studied that last week in detail, but we don't know what fruit is. Of course, sharing the gospel's fruit, but there is so much more than that. So much more. We'll talk about it today, knowing what fruit is. Something that always, well, it came to my attention some years ago. It's interesting, all across the world, especially where I'm from, um, many, many years ago, it became illegal to do, bring your Bible to school and to do Bible studies and to pray. And then you see the hostility of being a Bible-believing, Jesus-following, born-again Christian, even in the universities in Kenya. Um, there is a major atheistic movement, a movement of believing in evolution, um, and kind of just adopting Christianity along with other African religions, as there's some wisdom in it, but really this is the science, this is the truth. And it has come into university so much, many of you are aware of this because you are university students or you were. It's all around the world, this hostility towards Christ, this hostility towards truth, but on the other end of all of this, you see that Hollywood are so many people in the public arena, on television, different people, they always talk about God. Oh, I thank my God. You can do it at the Oscars. If you've ever seen the award ceremonies of Hollywood, they get up there, it's like, mm, yeah, God. I wouldn't be here without my God. And you see all of this happening. It is perfectly okay. In fact, if you ridicule somebody when they talk about God, it is very offensive. 
But when you get specific and you mention the name of Jesus, then that is offensive. And we're going to learn later on in the next chapter that, uh, or even in this chapter, the world will hate us because it hates Jesus if you are a real follower of Jesus. Excuse me. And so you see this, and there's something missing. In fact, it doesn't impress me at all when t- people talk about God. Oh, I thank God. I thank God. You got all these people thanking God. We need to mention who God is, and his name is Jesus Christ, and at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. All these people talking about God, this, God, this, and, and, and so many Christians are f- fooled by this, this rhetoric, this talk. They're like, hey, he talks about God. Hey, did you know that Denzel Washington is a Christian? He talks about God all the time. Now, we've seen that Kanye West is a little bit more vocal in the name of Jesus, but even that we got to be careful of, considering the lifestyle he continues to live and the people even in Christianity that he's become such good friends with, like Joel Osteen. What Jesus does in this chapter, John chapter 15, and what is something that he has continued to do all through his ministry in the New Testament that we've studied. And that is to provide a distinction between real, born-again followers of Christ and false followers of God. He continually provides a distinction all the time. That's what he's doing in John 15. He's, I am the true vine, abide in me, you'll bear fruit. Those who don't bear fruit will be taken away. And and there's different interpretations. I I really believe that there shouldn't be an argument there because both interpretations are true in in the sense that there's a New Testament doctrine supporting them. One of them is that God lifts people up out of the mud because of the way that vines grow, grapevines. But the best way to understand this, there are non-believers, there are believers, there are people who look like believers, like Judas. We get this context in the last few chapters. And they will be taken away because they bear no fruit. They've not been grafted in properly. They will be cast into the fire. Jesus continually does this, provides this distinction. It's very controversial, and Jesus would be the most controversial preacher in the world if he was here today, in the same way that he was the most controversial preacher in the world back then. He is always the foundation of controversy, because he is the only way. A A few examples, one of them would be the example of the parable of the sower. Matthew chapter 13 there in verse 1 through 23. We see there are four different soils. You see there's those who fall by the wayside, stony ground, thorny ground, and good soil. The ones that fall by the wayside, they fall on the ground, and before they can take any root, before the word of God, the seed is the word, okay? The sower is the son of God, but some fell by the, seeds fell by the wayside. They used to carry big paths pouches of seed, you know, before we got all this technology and farming. And still, it happens today for those who aren't large-scale farmers. Big pouches of seed, and they pull it out, and they scatter the seed. Well, a lot fall right by the wayside, by the side of the person. And so, before they take root, the devil, the Bible says, comes in, and he snatches up the seed before it goes into the soil. The second one is stony ground. It's shallow, it's stony. And it falls in, and the word is, and by the way, the the ground always being pictured here is the human heart, the individual human's heart. These are the different, these are the different ones. And they receive the word, the second group of people, they receive it. They believe it, it's true, but, Tribulation and persecution comes, but not any kind of tribulation and persecution. It says there in Matthew 13, 1 through 23, 
that tribulation and persecution because of the word. Because of the word, it comes. So they, they, they receive the Bible, okay? They go out and they start sharing the truth that they have so readily received. And in receiving this truth, they are receiving, because of the truth they're sharing, persecution, tribulation. They go out, they share it with family. The family begins to persecute them. They go out to their workplace, wherever it may be, they begin to share, and they can't handle the persecution or trials that come in sh being a real Christian and sharing the truth everywhere they go. And so they leave that word that they received. They leave it. They will not endure the trials and the persecutions of being a real follower of Christ. That's why in John chapter 8, the famous verse, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free, there's a whole verse to that. It says, if you continue in my word, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Truth never set anybody free per se, but a disciple who continues in the word will have freedom. So that we, we see this, and th because in the sower, they received the word, but they didn't continue in the word because they can't handle being ridiculed in preaching the truth. And guys, I know many people in this church who've gone out, shared the truth about Maybe they come from a Catholic background. The heresies in there, they go back to their family. They begin to share that, that we don't pray to Mary, that efficacious grace is a lie. That is, if you're baptized into the Catholic Church or communion through the Catholic Church, you're actually born again and that you're sealed completely. I mean, they begin to speak truth and they can't withstand the pressure that comes with being a truth spreader. It's too much for them, so they leave. Because of the word, the tribulations and persecutions came. And many of you well know that when you go around sharing the truth of Christ, oh boy, you'll be called a racist, a misogynist, a sexist, every name in the book. You're narrow-minded, everything. Thirdly, you have thorny ground. This is also another soil. Some of those people it, it leave. I, I would have fallen to thorny ground more than the other. I am really born again, but it, this happened to me. I was the thorny ground all of my life till the age of 21 where I really got born again. I didn't care that people made fun of me for you know, or whatever, from being narrow-minded, because I believed in Jesus before I got born again. But it says this thorny ground that the cares and deceitfulness of riches, of money, chokes out that word that was initially received with gladness. Pleasure and money. Pleasure and money. Now, it's not to say if you have money, you can't be saved. It's to say when money has you, you can't be saved. When money is your priority over God, when money is the, me the means to all the ends in life, or money is the end and everything else is a means, but when money just becomes a means by glorifying God, it's okay. But, but pleasure as well. The cares of this world, deceitfulness of riches. It chokes out that word that was initially received. I cannot even begin to think of all the people who have come through this church. They haven't, they haven't come into the church and stopped, become members and committed Christians. They've come right through. And we're one of those churches where so many people come through because I guess it's interesting from the outside, everything from the physical to the spiritual, the, the building, the age group we are, the, the, the diversity of ages, the, the, the music, people, will, a lot of people will come into this church. And they've done it since the beginning. Or they just, they're amused by me. Some crazy white guy on stage who talks about marijuana. Whatever it may be. But they really, they might have received that word, but the world is just calling them that pleasure. 
Man, that pleasure, all those things, you see this. But then you see the, the good soil, those who really get born again. They hear the word, they understand it, and what do they do? They bear fruit. It says in there in Matthew 13, they bear fruit, some 30, some 60, and some 100 fold. And if I were to ask everybody in this room today, hey, which one do you want to be? You want to be 30 or 100? I think most of us would say, hey, I want to be 100 fold. I want to bear fruit in the kingdom. I want to do something. I mean, maybe there's a few amongst us be like, listen, the whole 100 fold thing is not for me. Just, I'm glad I'm born again, and that's it. I'll bear, tw- I'll bear, t- I'll bear it fivefold, okay? No, no, no. And today we're going to learn about seven things that is fruit bearing. What is fruit? But also you see the parable of the wheat and tares. Another illustration, another illustrative distinction that God gives, that Jesus gives. He says, listen, this is the ground, but also there's the wheat and tares, also found in Matthew 13. That the Son of God plants wheat, that is, those of us are the wheat, we're born again, but the devil plants tares in the church. Do you know that there is a tear over there in Jerusalem that looks identical to a wheat, a wheat stalk? And the the only way you can identify the difference is if you pull out the roots. If you pull out the roots and you examine the roots. And those who have a firm foundation when the trials, the persecutions, and the cares of this world, they come. If your house is built on the rock, it will withstand all those things that's built on the sand, it will crumble over. Which leads to the most startling of all distinctive illust- stories that this is a, actually a, a, a God prophesies, Jesus prophesies in Matthew 7. And this is the scariest one of all. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not do, uh, cast out demons in your name? Did we not do mir- many miracles in your name? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. That is the most scary, distinctive uh, things Jesus ever says about those who were really born again and those who aren't. In other words, it is impossible to deny the reality of what Jesus is preaching in the New Testament. It's impossible to deny the reality that not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, to Jesus Christ is born again. Not everyone who does this. In fact, those of you who were here about three years ago, it was the first Sunday we opened this place. I, I, many of you were here. This was, that was the passage we shared on Matthew 7. I think it scared people into heaven. I mean, so many people got saved that day. You, you see Jesus constantly doing this. By the way, those who say, Lord, Lord, they're not Hindus. Yeah, they're not born again either, but they're not Hindus, they're not Muslims, they're not atheists, they're not evolution, prof- uh, evolution uh, professing, believing people. These are people in the church that say Jesus is Lord. The tares. I have been to many churches around the world, hundreds of them. I've been to good ones, I've been to not so good ones, and I've been to heretical ones. I I love church culture. I love going to different churches. I even once traveled a a good distance in the States to go to a heretical 18,000 member church just so I can experience what is going on here. And it was terrible, let me tell you, terrible. I, I've had many conversations with groups that I've gone with to these churches or my wife will go and be like, you know what? This heretical church, we know what they preach. In fact, they shared it a little. And sometimes 
at times I have gone and you kind of realize, hey, I'm, I'm here and they're heretical. I'm the preacher. Lord, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to say? Do I call him brood of viper? I don't know. It's always an awkward moment when you call somebody a brood of viper. I've never done it, actually. I've said other things. But one of the things I want people to walk away realizing is that you, because you can get confused at times. You'll be like, those people talked about God the entire time. Those people talked about how much they love Jesus the entire time. Now, I'm not saying we need to go out and identify who's a believer or not. We're not to do that. We are to speak truth, and we are to identify what is wrong in lies. We don't tear up the tares with the wheat. The angels will do that on Judgment Day. But I do know this. They preach lies. They talk about how they love Jesus, and I'm not going to be deceived by it, even though my heart wants me to be deceived by it. Like, man, they talk about Jesus a lot. Maybe, maybe they're just way off, you know. Maybe they just don't know that that's a doctrine of demons. Jesus constantly provides this distinction. That's the point. He does it also here in chapters 15. Let me read you the first 11 verses and we'll do a little sermon today. I am the true vine, Jesus says. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. I know we read this last week. I'm aware of this, okay? You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. Now, guys, something that we didn't see, that I'm talking about this week that we didn't last week, there's a progression. Those who are in Christ will bear fruit, and then he will prune so that they do what? Bear more fruit, and then after being in him and bearing fruit, getting pruned and bearing more fruit, then continually abiding in him, it mentions twice, then we bear much fruit. You see the progression in the same way that you see 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. You see fruit, you see more fruit, and then you see much fruit. We're going to discover how to be those who have much fruit today. For without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. There is the distinction. Yet we have it again. We saw the parable of the sower, the parable of the tares, Matthew 7, where people say, Lord, Lord, and then we have it again. Those who bear fruit, more fruit, much fruit than those who will be cast out because they have no fruit. It's impossible to be a Christian, a real Christian, a real born-again person, and bear no fruit. And they are cast into the fire. You see it. If you abide in me and my words in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. We studied those eight verses in detail last Sunday, but he goes on and he says, As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. Now, that is a literal thing. Jesus is about to do it. He goes on saying, I'm your friend. And yes, it is saying that when you literally die for your friends, that there's no greater love than that. But there are ways we can metaphorically die 
for our friends, for our communities that would bear much more fruit. So we see these benefits of abiding. That is salvation, Christ will be in us, we will be in him, we will abide in the true vine and we will have eternal life. But secondly, in the subject today, fruitfulness. We talked about pruning last week. Now fruitfulness, I don't want you to leave this morning not having at least the seven that I'm gonna give you ways that you can bear fruit.
she's in heaven, that woman never, barely ever spoke without quoting something and praising God. Just all day long, there's the word of God coming out of her mouth and praising him. She has a lot of fruit, and she has a lot of reward because of that fruit. Fruit is a sacrifice of praise to God on our lips. Praise is confined to his divine revelation. You grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever, and you will have a sacrifice of praise, the knowledge of God. You bring truth to every situation. Number four, fruit increases when we give to those in need and give to ministry. Fruit increases when we give to those in need and give to to our church, give to ministry, give to God through our local church. That's the, new, that's the biblical model. Paul says this in Philippians 4. It's fascinating to me. Four, 14 through 17, he says, Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Then he says this incredible thing. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Paul is an amazing man, is he not? He's like, listen, I'm a missionary. You've been supporting me financially, this church, the Church of Philippi. But the most exciting part of you giving me money is you get the fruit of giving me money. <laughs> it's like when you get money, is that your excitement? <laughs> when somebody gives to you, it's like, I am so excited for you that you're giving me money. <laughs> Praise God that you get to be blessed. That's what Paul is essentially saying. I am so excited that you just gave me that money, but I'm excited for you more than me. Because those who give to missionaries or churches or those who are in need bear fruit. That is fruit bearing. First of all, guys, let me just say this right up front. You, as a believer, you need to give to God your first fruits. But this goes well beyond that. Maybe you're at your workplace and you come outside of yourself, which you should be all the time, thinking of others, and you see somebody who looks really down, whether you work at one of the buildings in town or the mechanic shop or a doctor or a lawyer or a fundi, whatever it is. You see one of your colleagues down. You're like, hey, you seem really down today. What's, what's going on? They say, you know what? Last night, on the way home, I was robbed. They took all my money for the whole month. And, and 3,000 shillings. I, you know, I got food for a couple days, but I don't know. You're like, man, so sorry. You know, have a good day. See ya. No. And maybe you have to because you don't have the money, but you say, listen, that's, I'm sorry about but I don't, I don't have 3,000 to give you, but I do have 500. Why don't you go get some food? You give it to them? You are bearing fruit when you do that in Jesus' name. You are bearing fruit. A fruit-bearing Christian is a generous person financially. Not a careless person financially, but a generous I have seen more fruit and blessing come out of my family's life in our giving of money. Can't even imagine some of the things that God has done. Just because we have decided we will be generous. Number five, fruit is edifying communication. 1 Thessalonians 5.11, Paul says, so encourage each other and build each other up just as you are already doing. I was on YouTube one time, and I saw this, this, this caption. It's celebrities read mean tweets. I clicked on it because I'm an idiot. 
And these celebrities are reading these tweets about themselves. They are the most awful things people say to them. Horrific things. And, and very vulgar. And I'm sitting there and people are laughing like it's comedy. That is the world, not Christians. We don't go around tearing each other down with our words. We are to go around building each other up and it brings fruit. Now we can joke around and have a good time as long as it doesn't damage people. There are things we can joke with men about that we don't joke with women about, guys. It's like we can joke about men's weight, no problem, right? It's like, hey, dude, you're getting fat. <laughs> you know, guys think it's funny. Don't go up to women in this generation in Kenya and tell them that. Just don't do it. Right, ladies? Aren't you tired of it? So you're getting fat. It's like, oh, yeah? Yeah, well, this fat will never like you. Edifying words. Encourage people. It brings fruit. Number six, fruit is pure conduct, holy living. Philippians 1.11, the Bible says, being filled with the fruit of righteousness, which are by Christ Jesus to the glory of God. When we are filled with the fruit of righteousness, we are bearing fruit. Somebody comes up, you just got born again. They're talking about their plans to go out and party. You're like, you know what, guys? I, lo I love you guys. I know that I've been a part of that life, but I belong to Jesus now. I love him, and I just want you to know, once you come to church on Sunday after you're done partying Friday and Saturday, I'll be there waiting for you. And guys, don't be that, that jerk Christian, that, that holier than thou. After you get saved, people are like, we're going to the club. Fornicator. I know what they do at the clubs. You just got done fornicating a week ago before you got born again. It's like, yeah, drunkards, the wrath of God be upon you. Don't be a weird Christian. Be like, oh, you know what, guys, I really care for you. I'm, I'm not going to be a part of that life. Instead of rebuking it, deny it so that they can see the example of holy living, which will bring fruit into your life and into theirs. Don't... I, I, one of the things that really bugs us who were non-Christians before I got saved is how shocked Christians are at sin. Like they've never sinned. You ever notice this? I mean, I used to, I remember a Christian came around when I was smoking a joint. I smoke joints everywhere. And they were like, oh, he's smoking a joint. I was like, what are you from another planet? It's just weed. <laughs> it's a big deal. God told us to, to enjoy all the herbs, you know? Rasta, you know, stupid stuff. But I got to tell you, I think they behave just as badly as I did. I determined that when I got born again, I will never be shocked by people's sin and disgust. <gasps> Tell you, I'm shocked at pastor's sin and what they preach. And lastly, fruit is bringing people to Jesus. Guys, when you do these seven things, fruit is resentment and resistance to sin. Fruit is an attitude of the Spirit uh, uh, of God in you. Fruit is a sacrifice of praise to God on your lips. Fruit increases when we give to ministry and those in need. Fruit is edifying communication. Fruit is pure conduct. When you do those six things, you will have the power to bring people to Jesus. A life that does those just six things, and those are only seven things, by the way. There are many ways to bear fruit. And the worship team, come on up. You, when, this is the fruit, guys. This is fruit bearing and if you are in Christ, you will do these things. Amen? So what we're going to do now, we still got eight minutes to do what we need to do. We may be two minutes late. Is we're going to receive today's offering. We're going to listen to the last song as we do it. Those who are going to be baptized, if you need to change, you can. If you don't need to change, that's fine. We're going to get ready for that. But guys... Can you imagine if there's just the people here, there's a bunch of people, just if we 
did these six things this week? Can you imagine if we did this? We would not be able to contain the crowds that would be pouring in this church. You guys realize this, right? You would, we, we would need to buy the biggest building in the world or build it. If we were resisting sin, having the fruit of the Spirit, the attitude of the fruit of the Spirit coming out of us, sacrifices of praises in our lips, increased in our giving when we can to, to those in need, edifying words, pure conduct. If we did those just this week, you would bring a train in people following you to this church. They'd be like, what church do you go to? We need, get this, every place you go to needs to be better when you leave. Your workplace, your friendships, your family, even the house or the apartment that you're renting, it will be better when you leave. That landlord will walk in and be like, golly, I'm glad I rented to these people. You don't want to be that Christian that says, I will never rent to Christians again. When we were uh, trying to get this land leased, a long-term lease, the owner had determined he will never rent to a church again. And guess what? I told him, give us a chance. We won't let Christ down. And when they started leasing to us, they started telling us to take more of their land. Hey, will you take this land over here and that land over there? We love leasing to this church. Everywhere you go needs to be left better when you leave. Everywhere. Because you are in Christ and you bear fruit. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for these people who heard it, who bore it, who endured it, who listened, and who will obey it most of all. Bless them. May we bear fruit, fruit worthy of repentance. I pray your Holy Spirit pour out upon us. In Jesus' name, amen. As the ushers and deacons come forward to receive the offering, would you stand on your feet and sing this last song?